If you purchased a camera today, would you recommend the Sony FX3 or the Canon M6 Mark II for documentary style vlog or vlog content or any other suggestions? I also like to take pictures on occasion. Uh, thanks. And again, great content. Let's say there was a disaster and all of my gear got destroyed and I needed to set up a quick um, like startup, then if I were going to be thinking about doing like multi-camera stuff, I would definitely consider getting uh, two FX30s and one FX3 as a multi-cam setup. And then I would use the one FX3 as my run and gun uh, when I'm not shooting any kind of multi-cam setup. Uh, I would use the two FX, uh, I would definitely use the, uh, the FX3 for all of that. So uh, this is a great question uh, because uh, it requires an individual who is considering this uh, to take into account the following uh, mental model. This is called the creatives Venn diagram, uh, the creative model uh, or the managers model or the tech technicians model in order to maintain and uh, understand uh, expectations. It is nearly impossible uh, to, if, uh, if not unreal, to uh, be able to produce something uh, that is both uh, high quality, fast, and cheap, right? Or rather uh, is free, instant, and uh, the uh, the best quality, right? You, that's, it's on, uh, you can't, it's not gonna happen. So when it comes to making any kind of decision as to what is the gear and the technology that you're gonna be using, you have to take into account these three things and you have to pick one, maybe two of those. Uh, the thing is, if you want something that is going to be of the utmost highest quality, then uh, you're going to be sacrificing speed and you're going to be paying up the nose for it. Uh, if you want something that is instant, right, uh, you're also going to be paying up the nose for it. And you're also um, uh, sacrificing on quality, possibly. Uh, if you want something that is free, right then uh it may not come to you instantly uh and the quality may not be the best right this this is the situation and reality of life so when it comes to producing content one of the things that you need to kind of establish for yourself especially when it comes to vlog content the first thing you want to ask is why what do you, what is this for right uh, because that uh, the reasoning that context matters and it's going to determine which one one or two of these uh, factors that you're going to choose for yourself. So um, I would assume the reason to produce any kind of, uh, well, for documentary content, right? I'm gonna choose the first one, which is uh, personal to me. Uh, for documentary content, uh, this is something that most of us grew up with is home videos, right? Documenting and capturing precious moments, uh, moments that mean more to us than maybe anybody else. Uh, things like the uh, birth of a child, um, the moments in everything in, in terms of their growing up, uh, the fun stuff that you might be doing with friends and family, the adventures and travels that you might be going on. What is it that you'd be willing to spend on do you, or, or focus on with relation to those elements? Now, for me, over the last decade plus, I've had the opportunity to develop skills that allow me to shift between making a decision on what I want to do. Now, most common situation with relation to documenting stuff with relation to things that are personal uh, for family, things like that, the cell phone is probably the best option, right? So right away, the cost factor is low, the speed is high, but the perceived quality of it, is it something that would make for uh, Hollywood silver screen? Absolutely not. But is it something that would be appropriate for capturing memories? Sure. Now, for me, one of the things I would like to do is I would like to capture memories and moments that are personal to me at higher and higher quality. In fact, one of the things that I kind of do on the regular to the annoyance of my significant other, my better half <laughs> at times, is uh, I'll run around with this guy right here. This is this is my home movie family rig <laughs> for the most part. Where did the truck come from? Right there. Okay, where does it go? One last look at the chicken before it goes bye-bye. Before Bedal swallows it. <laughs> Papa, cheese. cheese. Oh, 
uh, most recently, actually before this, this is a Canon EOS M, uh, the original Canon EOS M. Um, it's rigged up with a Tokina 28-270 uh, with some focus gears and 3D focusing and battery. Uh, like this is the, this is the kind of stuff I've been using. This is one of my first interchangeable cameras, by the way. I uh, bought it back in 20, uh, 2013, 10 years ago. Uh, I bought this camera, the, used it professionally, used it for work. Um, and so it's been through a lot. Right now it's been it's uh, sort of hacked with a magic lantern, which allows you to unlock so many different things that the sensor is capable of. Again, you get good quality, right? But then, uh, and with everything that's been added on here, like the camera itself is cheap. Uh, that camera goes for like maybe 200 bucks on eBay. Um, uh, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more. Uh, but the moment you're trying to get it to a quality that is desirable, at least in, for me, um, you know, all these little accessories uh, tend to add up. So the cost has to go high and the turnaround for being able to process and uh, edit raw footage is not fast. So. Uh, this is one of the things that I tend to go with. And most recently, so this is what I've been using for family outings. Uh, essentially, this is a full frame 5D Mark III from Canon. It's a photo camera. It is a fantastic, wonderful, uh, even to today's standards, a wonderful photo camera. Um, and at the same time, uh, I've got a little V-mount battery on here, got a little uh, cheap, uh, cheap monitor, Insta360. Um, and on this, I also have Magic Lantern so I can produce raw videos that I can then process. Again, cost relatively is not that high, right? The camera itself, you could probably get it on eBay today for about 500, maybe $600. Um, lenses, that's up to you. EF lenses is relatively cheap. Insta360 for gyro data stabilization and an additional wide angle. Um, and all these little accessories, yeah, they tend to add up a little bit, but relatively speaking, it's not that much, right? $200, $500, $200, $30. Um, how much is that? So 360, I don't know. Uh, maybe $500 total with that one inch edition, maybe $300. So the so five plus three is 800 plus five uh, is uh, 1300 plus uh, 150, uh, that's 14, 1500. Um, so this is probably just over a $1,500 rig if you were to buy it today. Again, relatively speaking, not that expensive in relation to um, you know, an FX3, especially, which is like $4,000 plus, or a uh, Canon EOS M6 Mark II, which is $2,500 plus right now, brand new. So, uh, and then the image that comes out of here is fantastic. So, but again, it's, it's a question and a decision of, uh, am I going for speed, cost or quality? Now, what happens when you upgrade to something like uh, a, uh, a ZV-E10, right? Uh, do you get the same quality as these guys when it comes to raw images? No, absolutely not. Even with a Canon EOS M6 Mark II, uh, the images coming out of that are great. I would, that's uh, fantastic. 4K high resolution oversampled, uh, what, 6K plus down to 4K um, C log, but does it compare to raw images? In my opinion, absolutely not. And so, uh, but then again, uh, what you get in a slight reduction in quality uh, you get a huge boost in speed and time is money, right? And so it's a question of like, now if I were to do it for professional setting, right? For vlogging, uh, what would be the appropriate setup? Now, it comes down to a question of what are the features that are important to you? Um, and this comes down to then deciding if you're going to go in a professional setup, um, what are the, um, what are the things that are going to, give more value, right? Whether that value is being delivered to your clientele or to your viewers or both, um, then that's something that you got to kind of think about and decide. Now, the mental model that I share with colleagues and anybody here would be the thought of the three things that you, that would produce a quality image that would give a perceived production value, um, essentially is the clarity of sound. That's one the uh, uh stability of the image right and the third factor is the composition with relation to the framing and lighting so those three factors are going to determine how good your image is so this guy right here is a uh, tokina uh 28 to 70 millimeter standard zoom lens don't worry so much about the brand of lens but the focal length this is a 28 to 70 standard zoom lens 
relatively wide to uh, relatively tight. Now, knowing what I know now, uh, if I want a good quality image with relation to uh, composition, I would want something that has a standard zoom lens, right? Um, whether it's a 28 to 70, 24 to 70, or it is an uh, 17 uh, to 55 or 18 to 50 on a crop sensor lens, that's a standard zoom definitely want to have in my kit. This here, uh, I showed it in the previous video, 28 to 105 f 2.8. You get greater reach, so more options with relation to composition, uh, but what you're trading off is in size and portability, right? This is a crop sensor camera, uh, that is uh, mounted on a full frame lens with a focal reducer, but like this is no longer portable. This is not small. It fits in my bag because of the small height on the Sony ZV-E10. Now, this brings me to the question of if I were to purchase a camera today for that kind of setting where I definitely want um, uh, decent lens choices, right? Uh, then I would consider most definitely a Sony FX30. This is like if I were to build out four professional needs that has a relatively good turnaround time, um, an acceptable quality of image that does re relatively decent in a controlled setting and even dynamic setup that's not going to overheat on me, I would most definitely consider an FX30. I say this based on my experience with the ZV-E10. The ZV-E10 is almost a perfect video centric hybrid camera that takes decent photos uh, with the exception of two things that essentially still annoy me to this day. Uh, item number one has to do with uh, internal noise reduction that the camera has on by default. Lumix allows you to turn this off. Canon allows you to turn this off. Sony, for whatever reason, the only way to bypass the internal noise reduction is if you record the video externally via the HDMI and so then you will get a clear non noise reduced image and so uh, which is at least the, there's an option to do that and Sony in general their screens are not that bright so the uh, I tend to get some sort of external monitor um, for the uh, for the Sony's anyway um, and if I don't have the opportunity to have it for vlogging, uh, because I am going to be constrained with relation to location and portability, then I, I, I can still use the screen to an acceptable level. Um, and so if the screen was a little bit brighter, the, uh, the internal noise reduction was off. And the last, actually the third factor is also the rolling shutter. Now, rolling shutter is an issue in certain contexts and settings. Rolling shutter is a non-issue when it comes to stabilizing the footage uh, because it has the ability to, uh, I can do catalyst browse or even gyro flow, depending on my weapon of choice, then uh, it also mitigates and reduces the rolling shutter. So although it has a relatively slow sensor readout speed, which results in jelloing, uh, that could be mitigated um, through the rolling shutter correction that both Catalyst Browse and the uh, uh, um, gyro flow, that the two of them that they have, uh, it allows you to mitigate that. But it would be nice for us, uh, for a camera to have faster readout speed so the rolling shutter is reduced. The FX30 addresses one of those three things, uh, being the rolling shutter. Uh, the rolling shutter is twice as fast, or rather the sensor readout speed is twice as fast compared to the ZV-E10. It still does internal noise reduction, which can be bypassed by the HDMI, uh, but the um, the screen brightness, again, it's a Sony thing, so it's not gonna be that bright, but you can always add a monitor. So. One of those three things are resolved in the FX30 and the other two could be addressed through some sort of doohickey. Um, and so that's why I would consider that. And also the other reason is because of the cost. Um, the FX30, uh, relatively speaking, is more affordable in comparison to some of the other options that match the options and the features and the value that you get from the camera. The reason why I wouldn't consider a Canon as as great as the Canon R10 and the R7 uh, and the R6 Mark II and the R5R, uh, the reason I wouldn't consider it for vlogging uh, is just for the reason of that 
they don't have internal uh, internal um, uh, gyro data logging built into the camera. If Canon had that, I would hands down uh, put the R10 or the R7 on that list because of the fact that it also allows you to disable noise reduction. I've used the R10 um, for uh, board my friends for about a month while he was overseas. The image that comes out of that is great and it's decent in low light. And you know, you'll see some of these examples here. Um, and I can add a uh, Insta360 in the same manner that I've done here. Uh, that would allow me to then uh, capture the gyro data externally. Uh, but then again, you're also dealing with um, all kinds of uh, portability issues now that you're going to be uh, adding an external thing like that. Now, that brings me to the other factor with relation to addressing quality is what the FX30 does not provide, what the ZV-E10 does not provide. Um, and one of the reasons why I purchased the uh, 5D Mark III uh, for it uh, because of the full frame is due to the fact that it does a larger sensor camera will do better in low light, thus giving you a better quality image. And so um, part of the two options, the only or three options that come to mind with relation to that is the R6 Mark II, the A7C, and the FX3. Uh, and I'm not including the uh, A7S III, um, but now in my case, I've not used the A7S III or the FX3 personally for any of my projects, but while some of the folks that I work with, they on the regular use, they have three A7S III's that they purchased before the release of the FX3. And I'll tell you right now that the image that they're able to bring forth with that uh, is by far second to none um, in relation to the kind of image that comes out in video form. I'm not talking about raw video. I'm talking about uh, compressed video in a particular codec. The kind of content that comes out with that, um, they have like the, say it's the sensor of the A7S III, the FX3 is just amazing. Another buddy of mine uh, that I uh, collaborate with, he recently bought his own FX3 and he is ecstatic about it. And, and part of the biggest advantages of the FX3 over any other large sensor camera is the fact that it has amazing low light. And having a clean low light image is going to be of great value in a documentary vlogging run and gun non-controlled setting due to the fact that you can run that thing to 12,800 and higher uh, in a relatively clean image. And if you want to disable noise reduction, then you might get, want to get a monitor. Uh, but, uh, but at 12,800, it gives you the cleanest image in real, in comparison to most others. Now the uh, Canon R8, the Canon R6 Mark II, they also give you a clean, uh, 12,800 image, but not nearly as clean. That does not require, because uh, we're talking about speed now, right? If I get the Canon R6 Mark II or the R8 and I run that thing to 12,800, I will still give it a pass of neat video noise reduction, but that adds time, it reduces my speed. And so if I wanted to increase my speed by being able to get it right in camera, then the FX3 or the A7S3 would definitely fit the bill. But then there's a challenge though. Now you're paying for that, right? The cost, how much is a Canon R8? Um, generally speaking, 1500 or uh, uh, the FX3 is 4,000 plus. R6 Mark II is, um, uh, what 2500 so like again these features you're en gonna end up paying for if money was no object and if i could afford uh paying five thousand dollars right up front uh knowing that i'm i would have a uh, piece of kit a gear a tool that i could use across the board for almost anything the fx3 definitely would fit that bill um and in fact um if I knew I would be using it for professional purposes and the income that comes from doing client projects would subsidize my cost then the FX3 would definitely be it. Probably in one or two projects at most, the FX3 would pay for itself. 
Um, and what, and, and if you're not talking about the income that comes from that, but if you want to talk about how much you would put, then this is kind of quick tip for freelancers. Um, if you are ever brought in to produce content or produce a video, I think anything like that, and you're bringing your own gear, you put your own gear as a line item. Uh, so that way, uh, you're essentially renting out your gear, uh, to the client. Uh, and so they end up paying for the use of it, whatever the day rate uh per gear item is so this is something that's a quick pro tip so this is what i mean by how many projects would it take for the gear to be paid off with relation to how much you put into it and then every additional use after that is profit it becomes an asset for you because it's putting money in your pocket so this is something to consider uh with relation to the gear that you're gonna get so with the work that i'm doing right now so i'm just thinking about right like if everything got um like if all of my, let's say there was a disaster and all of my gear got destroyed and I needed to set up a quick, um, like startup, then if I were going to be thinking about doing like multi-camera stuff, I would definitely consider getting, uh, two FX thirties and one FX three as a multi-cam setup. And then I would use the one FX three as my run and gun. Uh, when I'm not shooting any kind of multi-cam setup, uh, I would use the two FX. Uh, I would definitely use the, uh, the, the FX three for all of that. Um, without a doubt. Now, if I were to only do studio and, and cost was definitely an issue, uh, meaning like, uh, I, I lost everything and I had no insurance and I just kind of had to pay stuff out of my pocket. Um, then I would probably say, um, starting with three different ZVE tens, uh, or even two of them is not a bad idea. So in addition to the camera bodies, you're going to want to pick some gear, right? So if I've got some Sony setup then one of the things I definitely want to be able to have is at least one autofocus lens. So, and that autofocus lens would probably be a, uh, a zoom of sort, a standard zoom. Um, and that standard zoom would probably be anywhere between a uh, Tamron 20 to 40 millimeter. If I needed some additional range, then I would consider the 35 to 150 millimeter. Um, and so, and in my case, like this right here is the uh, Tamron 28 to 105 uh, EF lens that's been adapted, uh, F 2.8. Uh, I'm surprised more people don't talk about this or have this, but this is an amazing piece of kit, uh, especially for travel, run and gun type of stuff. It gives you the wide angle, it gives you the tight angle um, all in one hand. The only downside is that it's just, you know, it's a little, it's it's chunky, right? It's it's girthy, it's, it's big. And so, um, uh, and you lose in portability. The alternative is with slightly better image quality. Uh, this, uh, uh, one of the things you'll notice is that this is a 28 to 70 from Tokina. Uh, this is great for gimbal work um, and video because it is nearly parfocal. For anybody who doesn't know, uh, parfocality, that's a word, when something is parfocal with relation to a lens that you can zoom into 70 millimeters, for example, in this case, focus up, zoom out and your uh, subject is more or less going to be in focus. That's one of the things that's really important with relation to video, especially when you're doing run and gun and you don't have autofocus, having a parfocal lens or something that's close to parfocal is going to be very important. So yeah, this is one of the reasons why I uh, appreciate uh, this particular lens, the Tokina uh, 28 to 70. Um, and this is also a classic lens. Uh, this lens has a history and story behind it. This lens is a collaboration between Ingenu, which is, if I'm not mistaken, a French optics company that makes some really, really expensive uh, video and cinema lenses, and Tokina themselves. Um, and they wanted to make something that was photocentric with some video um, specific traits. And so this particular lens is what had come to fruition. You could find it used on eBay for like two, 300 bucks. Um, great value for what you get. Now, one thing to consider is once you've got your standard zooms, um, you've got your one autofocus uh, zoom lens. So a 20, a 20 to 40 autofocus, uh, a standard zoom um, that you can use for video if you're not going to autofocus, right? So the Tokina 28 uh, to 70, or if you need some more reach, the 35 to 150 f2 to 2.8 vari variable zoom, uh, uh, very uh, variable aperture, a variable zoom. It also it is also um, variable zoom because you got multi very you got variations in your 
fo focal length. <laughs> um, uh, the other factor is you want to have something that is good for low light. I would highly advise and recommend that you get yourself um, two lenses that are good for low light. One good one lens for that uh, is a 24 millimeter. Uh, this is an f 1.4, uh, maybe even so two lenses would be a 24 millimeter and an 85, a 24 and 85 or 35 and 85. Those are two good pairings or a 20 and 50. 1.4 or a 24 and 50 1.4. Uh, those are two good pairings that you may want to have. If you got these three lenses in your kit, you're done. Like you're good. Anything beyond that is just exploring curiosities or addressing some specifics. But for the most part, um, you've got your standard zoom. You've got your uh, two wide, uh, two lenses, your wide and your tight um, that are geared towards low light and or gimbal use um, then anything beyond that is just more or less addressing a very specific need i'm not a big fan of ultra wide angle lenses unless it's addressing something very specific so for example this guy right here is paired with a uh, tokina 11 min 11 to 16 millimeter relatively cheap lens on a full frame so at 16 mil this gives me uh, full frame coverage, but when I'm using Magic Lantern and I want to get something like uh, 2.5K, 2.8K, 3K resolution um, raw, uh, it's going to crop into the sensor so I get something along the lines of an APS-C or Micro Four Thirds, i.e. a 2X crop on the full frame. And so for that reason, I'm actually then coming back down to what our standard focal lengths. So 16 millimeters ends up becoming something close to like um, anywhere between a 24 and 35 or 24 and 32. 11 millimeters ends up becoming something like a uh, 22 millimeter uh, if I'm cropping in 2x. So again, it's what you're, the, the lenses that I'm looking for based on this particular unique setup is just that. So. I hope that addresses some of your questions with relation to um, if I uh, to, to address the scenario of if I were to purchase a camera today, uh, which camera would I get now in an ideal scenario? Again, as a review, I would consider for the sake of video, but, you know, um, uh, yeah, for the sake of video with some photos on the side. Yeah, the FX3 would probably do it. Now, the question though, when you take pictures on occasion, I'm assuming you're gonna be using these pictures as not anything professional, right? Because the FX3 and the FX30 are both electronic shutter. The FX30 is probably not a good photo option using the electronic shutter due to the fact that that rolling shutter is gonna be apparent. Whereas on the FX3, that rolling shutter is extremely fast, very fast sensor readout speed. So having an electronic shutter is no big deal and you'll get 12 megapixel uh, stills on the fx30 you'll get something like uh 24 megapixel stills or close to that um in my experience canon cameras are almost um the perfect choice what i would suggest if you could if you really wanted something dedicated for uh photos that are good quality um spend three to five hundred dollars and get yourself a, a a canon dslr um that is dedicated just for photos um and uh and they'll be they'll take amazing photos um and uh, have the sony cameras as your dedicated video cameras if you can swing it so um i hope that was a value if you have any further questions let me know in the comments below i'll see you soon